Bob, Bob Evans, I'm the Chief Steward. Now, you are helping me and Darren celebrate the day on board the world's first modern ship. First ship made of iron with a propeller to go across any ocean of the world. And when it was built, the Great Britain was the largest ship in the world. 322 feet long, weighed 3,500 tons. Not just the largest ship, practically the largest metal object. Definitely largest moving object ever built 175 years ago. Designed by... Dark Kingdom Brunel. I'm just testing you on this. It's <laughs> Dark Kingdom Brunel. Built to carry 360 passengers from England across the United States. Unfortunately, people's knowledge back in the 1840s you put a piece of wood in water, it will float. Put a piece of metal in water, I'm not going to travel on that. <laughs> only 45 people brave enough to travel on the Great Britain's first journey to America. It was only on its fifth voyage, going to make a profit for the first time. 180 people brave enough to travel on the ship. Unfortunately, I think they over-celebrated when they left Liverpool. And later on that night, thought they were off the southern tip of the Isle of Man, going across the Irish Sea. In fact, they were 40 miles farther on. This rather large piece of land got in the way. Northern Ireland. <laughs> Under Ship of Granite, Dundrum Bay and Northern Ireland was stuck there for 11 months. Now, it's only because it was made of iron it was ever rescued from there. If it had been made of wood, conventional way of building ships at that time, it would have broken up. But it was rescued, proved the principle of the metal ship. Other shipbuilders then started to follow the same design. Unfortunately, the owners, the Great Western Steamship Company, went bankrupt, lost all their money. So the Great Room was sold to another company operating a service to Australia. In 1850, they found gold in Australia. A lot of people wanted to go there to make their fortune. From 1852 until 1876, the SS Great Britain visited Australia 33 times. 32 of those journeys circumnavigating the world. Going out round the coast of Africa, across the Indian Ocean, to Australia. Coming back across the Pacific, round the southern tip of South America, back across the Atlantic. Taking an average of two months to get there, two months to get back, non-stop each way. The fastest sailing ships on that route at that same time, such as that young ship up at Greenwich, mm -hmm. the Sark, which is 26 years younger than this one, her best time to Australia, 72 days. The SS Great Britain's best time, 53 days. You are celebrating today on board the 1850s equivalent of Concorde, the fastest way of getting around the world at that time. Originally 360 passengers, Journeys to Australia up to 750, twice the number. They put another deck above this, the full length of the ship. We estimate about a million Australians and New Zealanders are descendants of the passengers sailed there on the Great Britain. Oh, incidentally, the first journey back from Australia, 1853, they brought back seven tons of gold on board the Great Britain. <laughs> we had that today. That would be worth in excess of 160 million pounds. She brought that sort of value back on many of those journeys. She was used as a troop carrier for the Crimean War, First India Wars of Independence, carrying up to 1,600 troops at a time. In the year 1855-56, she carried 45,000 troops around the Mediterranean for the Crimea. The logistic value must have been phenomenal at that time. She ended up a days as a sailing cargo ship, gone in distress at Cape Horn, southern tip of South America. After suffering quite a lot of damage, turned to the Falkland Islands for repair the nearest natural landfall of any sailing ship in distress at Cape Horn. It got to the Falklands. She was then sold to the Falkland Island Company, used as a floating warehouse at Stanley Harbour, from 1886 through until 1935, storing wool and coal on board. First World War, two or three of His Majesty's warships refilled with the coal and stored on board the Great Britain for the Battle of the South Atlantic. In 1935, the top deck had rotted, no good for storage anymore. She was then offered to the Royal Navy as a target ship. They're going to charge the Atlantic, fire shells and sink her. Fortunately for us, the offer was turned down. She was then towed to a small bay in the Falkland, Sparrow Cove, purposely run onto the beach. Holes knocked in the bottom so she wouldn't float off. She remained there until 1970, when the SS Great Britain project, the charity was formed, bring her back to Bristol. And actually, before we get that far, Second World War, HMS Exeter, very badly damaged about the river plate, went to the Falklands for repair. We think she was a repair for some of the iron plates off the SS Great Britain. So that's four wars of Great Britain being involved in. In 1970, the Great Britain was floated onto a raft in the Falklands, towed 7,500 miles across the Atlantic on that raft, the longest piggyback that had ever been undertaken at that time. Incidentally, she came back across the Atlantic faster than she went out on her last journey, 1886. Went to Avermouth, six miles down the river from here. There she was patched up sufficiently once more to float upon her own bottom. 
Sunday, July the 5th, 1970, came up through the Avon Gorge underneath Brunel's Bridge, the Clifton Suspension Bridge. First time his ship and bridge had ever been seen together. That bridge was not there, the one and only occasion Great Britain left Bristol. Remained afloat from the outer harbour for two weeks. To in 1970, Great Britain floated back to its birthplace, this dock, on its birthday. Before they could build this ship, they had to dig this hole. This dry dock was built specifically to build the SS Great Britain. 19th of July, 1839, they started building it. 1843, Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, travelled from London on Brunel's Railway to launch his ship. He spent six hours in Bristol. The whole of Bristol closed down for the day, but his ceremony floated the ship out of this dock. After spending that six hours in Bristol, Prince Albert travelled back to London, got back to London 12 hours, 12 hours after he'd left London. Now, ten years before, it would have taken him over a day to get from London to Bristol before Brunel's Railway. In fact, it's only 1852 that Bristol's time became the same as London's time. Up until 1852, Bristol was always 10 minutes, 23 seconds behind London's time. It was only the start of the telegraph system on Brunel's Railway that time became unimportant. 19th of July, 1843, Prince Albert floated the ship out of the 19th of July, 1970, Queen Elizabeth's husband, Prince Philip, was on board when it came back in. It will never float again. The first modern ship in the first modern dockyard. Now, when it came back in 1970, just a hollow shell. You could not stand here. There was nothing to stand on, nothing above you. We've been working on it. Actually, put it in perspective again. Uh, about 20 years ago now, there was a statue erected at Bristol Complex, the other side of the harbour. Very famous son of Bristol. Uh, in the local press, cover times when that statue was erected, a photograph shown of that gentleman walking on the top deck of the Great Britain. The top deck consists of the scaffolding packs about this wide, with a handrail on either side. He was looking from here into the bottom of the ship. That gentleman was Archie Leach. Does anybody know his oh, yeah. stage name? Oh, yeah. Grant. Carrie Grant. Showed Carrie Grant walking on this top deck back in 1970. Now, back in 2005, we came to the end of one of the biggest conservation and interpretation programs in Great Britain. One of the biggest problems with the Great Britain, all the time is in salt water. The raw time from which it's made has been absorbing salts and chlorides. Very hostile environment at Bristol, as we found out over the last few day, days. Very high humidity level. That causes the salts and chlorides to be leached out of the iron, cause the iron to flake off. We had to do something about this. The analogy has been given. If you found a Roman centurion's helmet in the field, what would you do with that helmet? Put it in a museum. We could not find a museum big enough to put the Great Britain in. So we've actually created our own museum environment. Underneath these timbers we're standing on now, steel plate goes right the way across. From the top deck down to the dock wall, we got back to the base metal, lots of holes in it. You'd have a few holes in it after 175 years. Patched holes on the inside with fiberglass, filled with resin on the outside. Four or five coats of paint on top of that. The dock wall across to the side of the ship is a glass plate, a million pounds worth of glass. Okay. Into water on top of the glass. That water has two purposes. One, it defines the original water line of the ship, also acts as an insulator. The dry dock's been repointed. This has given us a sealed environment. Everything inside the ship and underneath that glass plate, sealed environment which we can now control. Out here at the moment, relative humidity, probably about 75, 80%. Inside the ship and underneath, it's less than 20%. Very dry environment. Recreate the environment I've got in the Arizona desert, where the Americans have mothballed so many aircraft because they're not coming over here. Hopefully keep the ship safe for the next few hundred years. The interpretation. All of the outside profile of the Great Britain has been recreated the way it looked the day it floated out of this dock even down to the flags trying from the top of the mast. Inside the ship, everything from the funnel to where we are now has been recreated the way it looked its first journey to America. Wedding ceremony this afternoon took place on the first class promenade deck of the Great Britain, where we have recreated some of the cabins along on either side. Below that, where I'm going to direct you very shortly now, the first class dining room. Could originally sit 160 people in there? We can now sit 160 people in there when we have three rows of tables. Before that is a full-size lightweight replica of the original engine. The largest ship in the world had the largest and most powerful engine. The original engine, 1,000 horsepower, weighed 340 tons. That's about the same weight as 40 double-decker buses. That lightweight replica, driven by electric motor, only weighs approximately 100 tons, or 12 double-decker buses. About nine years ago now, we invited a gentleman down here one evening just to push a lever one deck below there to symbolically turn that replica engine on. 
We asked him not to touch anything else. We should have known better. He was being filmed at the time. He had two microphones in front of him. One of those microphones wasn't quite in the right place for him. He went to move and he dropped that microphone from one de deck below us into the hold of the ship. I'm sure you'll recognise that gentleman's name, Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> Every time he comes down, he would have to tell Jeremy Officer. Uh, a few years before that, Jeremy promoted Brunel on a Great British contest. So I don't know if you remember that. Channel 4 programme, Churchill was first and that. Brunel was second. Our visit numbers went up by 15, 20% overnight as a result of that programme. He's a good ambassador for the ship. Forward of that, one deck below us, a recreation of the, first, uh, of the uh, ship's galley, the kitchen. Be assured, ladies and gentlemen, the food you're going to have very shortly has not been entering into that kitchen. And then forward of that, one deck below, a recreation of what it was like travelling third class on a two-month journey to Australia. And then below that, we left it all open and exposed. See what the ship looked like when it came back in 1970. Also see how it's originally constructed. But it's not just about the ship. The whole of the surrounding area. The buildings over here, we've got a museum. A new museum over here, being Brunel, that was opened up six weeks ago now. Uh, we've now become custodians of the National Brunel Archive. That's all being presented in there. Thank you very much indeed for being so patient. I know you're all hungry. Now, look, just a couple of things. As soon as it gets dark, we will be closing this top deck up. We haven't got any lighting up here. So uh, we've already closed the museum over the far side, so you can't get off that side anymore. The way on and off the ship now, down the stairs on this side, just outside, the steps down there lead you out to the top side. That's the way off the ship. Oh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, no smoking or vaping on board the ship itself. If you want to do any of that, down on the dock side. Don't tell anybody, you might see me down there as well. I'm not supposed to be seen smoking on side, but uh, that's it. Uh, first class dining room, where the reception is going to be held now. I'd like to go down starboard side, port side, two flights of stairs. You'll be in the first class dining room. Table plan just inside the room. Toilets are down on that deck level as well. Thank you very much indeed for being so patient, ladies and gentlemen. You'd like to make your way on down there.